بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Welcome to ERA Easy Radiology Approach We are talking now uh, in the third part of MRI of the epilepsy I am Dr. Muhammad Talat Assistant Professor of Radiology Cairo University In our routine approach for any case of epilepsy First we will search for temporal loop epilepsy as we discussed in the first two parts and the temporal loop epilepsy can occur at any age group. Once we exclude or rule out temporal loop epilepsy, we need to focus for other causes for epilepsy and I use mnemonic term vitamin C and D. Maybe vascular, but vascular it's less common to cause epilepsy, but it should be put in our consideration. For example, cavernous angioma or malformation involving the temporal loop, sometimes stroke or infarction. Infection, one of the most important causes for epilepsy, including herpes encephalitis. Trauma may happen to the patient if the patient is complaining of cerebral contusion. Autoimmune encephalitis, we will talk for a little bit in this part. Metabolic, it is a rare cause, idiopathic or iatrogenic. It's very rare. Neoplastic, one of the common causes for epilepsy, including low-grade gliomas. We have also congenital cortical malformation, one of the most common causes for epilepsy, especially in pediatric age group. Drug-induced, we will talk in brief regarding this point also. I need just to highlight one important thing or one term that may make confusion to our radiologist, what we call limbic encephalitis. What does it mean, limbic encephalitis? Limbic encephalitis really, some authors consider limbic encephalitis as a herpetic herpes encephalitis, and others consider this one as an autoimmune encephalitis. So if we have autoimmune encephalitis, it is considered as a limbic encephalitis. Also, if we have infection or herpes encephalitis, it is considered also as a limbic encephalitis. Let's move to autoimmune encephalitis. We have two types in autoimmune encephalitis, either baroneoplastic encephalitis. This occurs in association with another tumors occurs in the whole body. For example, the patient has bronchogenic carcinoma, and at the same time, complaining of paraneoplastic encephalitis. Non-neoplastic autoimmune encephalitis, this one is considered when the patient has autoimmune disease or disorder, for example, systemic lupus erythematosus, and at the same time, complaining of autoimmune encephalitis. As you see here, in this case, we have the amygdala appears swollen, and the hippocampus appears swollen, displaying abnormal high signal intensity in T2 which is weighted image and also abnormal high signal intensity in flare image. So this one, we should put it in our consideration if we are dealing in case of encephalitis. Autoimmune encephalitis rarely presenting with epileptic fits. Most commonly present or the patient will be presented or will present with uh, peripheral neuropathy Sometimes if it is involving the cerebellum, it can be, uh, uh, if, the, if the patient can develop uh, cerebral ataxia or something like this, but rarely or in very rare cases, autoimmune encephalitis can be presented by epileptic fits. We need to conclude these points together now. If we have a case, with abnormal high signal intensity in the hippocampus and amygdala, as you see here in this uh, image. If we compare this right side to the left side, the amygdala here, this is the normal size, this is abnormal size, swollen with high signal intensity. If the patient is complaining of epileptic fits, for sure we will think for our differential diagnosis, first will be mesial temporal loop epilepsy, we discussed this point in the last part, swollen amygdala, 
swollen hippocampus can be one of the manifestation, manifestations of temporal lobe, mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. The second, we can apply our mnemonic vitamin C and D. Maybe vascular, yes, maybe vascular. Maybe something like infarction. Maybe infection, yes, maybe herpes, encephalitis. Maybe trauma, maybe cerebral contusion, maybe history of trauma will support your diagnosis. Maybe autoimmune encephalitis, yes. Autoimmune encephalitis, as we discussed in the previous study. Metabolic, not common. Iatrogenic, not common. Neoplastic, yes. Maybe low grade glioma. C and D, not common. So, our differential diagnosis in any case with a swollen hippocampus or amygdala with abnormal signal will be mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. Other causes may be vascular infarction, maybe herpes, encephalitis, maybe cerebral contusion, maybe autoimmune encephalitis, maybe low grade glioma. One of uh, the most important causes for epilepsy, hypothalamic hamartoma, this is considered as a benign non-neoplastic heterotopia involving the tubercinerium. Tubercinerium is a part from the hypothalamus. Most commonly, the hypothalamic hamartoma, the patient with hypothalamic hamartoma is complaining of epileptic fits, sometimes associated with visual problems and the early onset of puberty. As you see here, this is the tubercinerium. We have mass well-defined mass involving the tubercinerium, hypothalamus. This mass, its signal intensity is very similar to the gray matter, iso-intense signal in T2, also iso-intense signal in T1, with no contrast enhancement. One, it is considered as a one of the most important causes for epileptic fits. So we should concentrate on the hypothalamus as well. Regarding the congenital causes, we will not discuss more in detail because I think this will take a separate session later on. But we need to focus what are the causes for cortical malformation, either abnormal cortical organization, this include, include type 1 and type 3 focal cortical dysplasia, polymicrogyria, schizencephaly. We have also abnormal proliferation, type 2 focal cortical dysplasia, hemimigalencephaly, microcephaly, and abnormal neuronal migration, heterotopia, and lysencephaly. You will see our demonstrative cases today, inshallah. So these are our algorithms or our approach in dealing with these cases. Let's move to our demonstrative cases. Uh, our first case in today, this child is complaining of epileptic fits. As we discussed before, we will go in, in a systematic way. We should see first the hippocampus. The hippocampus almost symmetrical with no any abnormal signal, without any gliosis, without any loss of its normal morphology. So we are searching now for any causes that can explain epilepsy. As we see here, you will find sub nodules in this case. Suspicious of heterotopia. Let us go and move to see the axial T2 with image. I think now it's clear. It's indeed subependymal heterotopia on both sides. I think it's now clear. As you see, subependymal nodules, its signal intensity is very similar to the signal of the gray matter in all pulse sequence. It's not enhancing. Let us review heterotopia. Heterotopia.
we have two types of heterotopia, either nodular or diffuse. Nodular, we have two types, either sub even diamond and subcortical. Diffuse, it is bent heterotopia. As you see here, the sub and the sub even diamond endures is considered a here as in this case sub even diamond nodular heterotopia. So uh, if we review the heterotopia, heterotopia is a congenital cortical malformation that happened secondary to interruption of the neural migration from the ventricles towards the cortex. If the interruption of the neuron happened at the level of the ventricles, it will be manifested as a nodular sub epidemic heterotopia. If it is interrupted at this level, it will it will appear as subcortical nodules. If it is diffuse form of heterotopia, it will make something like band going parallel to the cortex. So this is in brief heterotopia. Let us move to our second case. Our second case for today is this patient is complaining of epileptic fits. As we, as we see here, the hippocampus is totally normal on both sides, symmetrical. So we don't have any cause of temporal loop epilepsy. Let us review the rest of the image. This is a corona flare. We have something abnormal in the right front region. Let us focus in the right front region. We have something abnormal in the subcortical white matter, abnormal high signal intensity with blurring of the gray-white gray matter interface. So our differential diagnosis in this case will be focal cortical dysplasia type 1 because the cortex is not thickened. If the cortex is thickened, it will be switched to be type two focal cortical dysplasia. We have three types of focal cortical dysplasia. The first type is abnormal signal intensity in the white matter. The type two is abnormal signal in the white matter with cortical thickening. Type three, it is considered as focal cortical dysplasia or abnormal signal with other pathology. So we have here most likely to be focal cortical dysplasia. Our differential diagnosis in this one may be hamartoma, may be starting low-grade glioma. So this one need to be followed up. Close follow-up is very important in this case. This is the third case that we have today, as you see here. This child is complaining of uh, epileptic fits and the clinician is uh, uh, suspecting encephalitis. And uh, we, after reviewing the case, we reviewed uh, hippocampus. It's, it's normal in configuration, normal in signal intensity. Let's go to the other abnormality in this case. We have here a swollen splenium and body of the corpus callosum with intrinsic abnormal high signal intensity in T2 weight image. Look for the flare image. Focal high signal intensity in the splenium, as you see here. We have also some dilated vercaurubin spaces in the white matter. It's not significant. So let us focus in our abnormal here involving the splenium of the corpus callosum. If we review the ADC map, it's striking restricted diffusion. Let us review the, the diffusion with image also. Look for this one. So for sure, we have focal cytotoxic edema involving the splenium of the corpus callosum. Really, 
we reviewed the case with the referring clinician. We found that the clinician started to give the patient anti-epileptic fit, uh, anti-epileptic drugs for this patient. Once we have something like this or focal abnormality of the spleen of the corpus callosum, we have a long differential diagnosis, a long differential list. The most common is Caesar's. Caesar's complex relationship. Either there is starting anti seizure medication or cessation or withdrawal of anti-epileptic drugs. Also, sometimes it happened with the seizures without any medications. So this is the most important uh, point here to explain the case. Otherwise, we have other differential diagnosis for this abnormality, either metabolic disorders, either infection, either sometimes in as malignancy. But this is the logic thinking in this case, once we have something related to the spleenium of the corpus callosum, cytotoxic edema, ask for any anti-epileptic drugs, either starting epileptic drugs, anti-epileptic drugs, or withdrawal, sudden withdrawal of anti-epileptic drugs, sometimes happens without anti-epileptic drugs, just, just with patient with acute onset of seizures. Our last point that we need to discuss today, post ectary changes, take care that if we are imaging a patient with epileptic fits uh, shortly after the epileptic fits itself, sometimes there is a transient MRI finding that mimic tumors, that mimic uh, infarction uh, and something like this. So uh, if we are dealing with a patient for a short period after the epileptic fits, take care if there is any cortical or subcortical abnormalities, sometimes presents with also diffusion restriction. Uh, sometimes if we inject the patient contrast, uh, sometimes you will find cortical and leptomeningeal contrast enhancement. The differential diagnosis for this case, encephalitis and subacute ischemic changes. As you see here in this image, the axial flare image shows cortical and subcortical areas of abnormal signal, signal intensity in the left temporal and the left occipital, left hyperite regions. And also these areas shows evidence of restricted fusion. So take care of this one because in the follow-up, all of these changes most likely to disappear totally. So don't misdiagnose or uh, diagnose this one as a, as a stroke or a tumor or something like this. Take care of this one. This one needs follow-up to be sure is it transient or not. If it is transient, so for sure it is post-ectary post changes. Thank you so much and thank you for attending our lecture.